I'm going to invite you to go ahead and take a seat and grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16 is our text tonight. If you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that is perfectly fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you, turn to page 1130, and you will find Romans chapter 16. Uh, and as always, if you're here and you don't own a Bible, you don't have one that you can read, and you want one, then please take one of those with you. It's our gift to you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God, because we know if you read it, then God will change your life. Hey, it is uh, great to be back with you. I just got to say, uh, for those of you who just got here as well, or you're visiting tonight, uh, I've been away for a couple of weeks. I've been in uh, Kenya uh, with our mission team from Calvary, and I just want you to know that uh, the, the trip was a, a great success. We got to go and bless uh, about 100 plus missionaries uh, for two weeks, taking care of their kids. I had the privilege of speaking into their lives, both personally as well as some teaching time. And, and so uh, thank you for uh, you know, being a church that believes in taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. And, and we had the, the privilege of serving alongside and with and blessing uh, a number of missionaries who are living in really harsh conditions. And, uh, and, and so it was just an honor and a joy to, to work with them. So thanks for your support in that. Thanks for your encouragement. A, a lot of you have welcomed me back. And uh, yes, I'm still jet lagged, but that's okay. Uh, we'll recover. So, you know, jet lag is real. Uh, and by the way, uh, we've got mission opportunities that are coming up next year. If you want to serve, if you want to travel and go and bless and do, we have lots of opportunities. There's opportunities in Thailand next July, medical missions, uh, as, and beyond that. We've got uh, an, another small opportunity in Mozambique next year. We've got a trip planned to Hawaii, uh, to Idaho. We've got all kinds of ministry opportunities and, uh, and then possibly more. So, uh, just if that's something that interests you, let us know. We love to keep you in the loop, love to involve you in, in one of those trips. So uh, how do you say goodbye? Hi, are, you, are you a long goodbye person or a short goodbye person? Uh, how many of you are long goodbyes? Let, let's see your hands. Go ahead. You can, you can confess. Okay. Number of you. How many of you prefer short goodbyes? Oh, a lot more of you are short goodbye people. Okay, I can relate to that. I'm a short goodbye person. Uh, that's just my natural bent. And probably short enough that it can seem rude sometimes. <laughs> right? Because once you're at that point, uh, at least for me, where we're like, we got to go, we got to leave. Then let's just say goodbye. You know, tell people you love them, tell them you'll see them, bless them, and then get in the car and go. You know, get the, hit the road and let's leave. You know, I don't want that long, awkward pause, like what, what do we say, talk about now, you know, how many times do you have to hug before you, it's okay to go? I mean, it's just, it's one of those things. So, you know, short goodbye, long goodbye. Uh, the Apostle Paul, I mean, we've been reading his letter to the Romans now for about six months. Uh, he is a long goodbye type of person, at least by his letter to the Roman church. Okay, We're talking about the Roman Christians, uh, first century uh, just a few decades after Jesus has, you know, left the earth after his resurrection. And, and this is the, the, chapter 16 is the final message. It's the end of the road. He's saying goodbye. Uh, it's the longest letter that he's written. And, uh, and it's honestly a long read. If, if you've read Romans 16, it, the Apostle Paul refers to 36 people by name or reference. 36 people he brings greetings to or from in this letter. And it's just like a list of name after name after name after name. And it's like, Paul, can't you just like wrap this up? <laughs> I don't know, at least, you know, that's how spiritual I am when I'm reading this. But then, because look, you don't know who these people are. I mean, if you do an intense study of church history, you still don't know who half these people are. Because they're only listed one place. And that's in the book of Romans. And, and he doesn't say anything about them. Uh, but... But here's the thing, in the midst of the names, he actually pauses and he adds some closing remarks that are really powerful. Romans chapter 16, verses 17 through 20 is what I want to call your attention to. A brief section that says so much as a final appeal to us. So the apostle writes, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. 
For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. For your obedience is known to all, so that I rejoice over you, but I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So once again, Paul makes exceedingly clear the priority of the mission. The priority of the mission. Uh, Paul's life was dedicated to leading people to Jesus. That, that's why he traveled. That's why he preached. That's why he taught. That's why he wrote letters. Nothing mattered to Paul but people discovering life in Jesus Christ. That's what his life was about. That's what his letter is about. And in this letter to the, uh, to the Romans, he reminds them of the priority of the mission. Now, he was so committed to this that in the letter to the Philippian church, in chapter 1, he said to live as Christ and to die is better. To live as Christ and to die is gain. And so in his final instructions, the apostle gives a warning of distractions. Did, did you catch that? He gives a warning of distractions. In verse 17, he says, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you've been taught. Avoid them. Avoid them. This is a warning. He says, look, I don't want anything to distract from the gospel. I don't want anything to create an obstacle that would prevent people from coming to Jesus. That's what he's saying. Look, understand there are things that people do. There are things that people do for selfish reasons, for immature reasons that are going to distract you from the mission of Christ. And I don't want any of those things to hinder the work of the church, which is introducing people to Jesus Christ. And we need to hear this because it wasn't just the church in Rome that is subject to distractions. Every single church I've ever been a part of is tempted to get distracted from the mission by all kinds of things that seem good and important or really aren't important at all at the time, but they, they still become distractions. Like, for instance, theological debates can become distractions. I mean, look, we're supposed to study Scripture. We're supposed to, to make it an important part of our lives, and it should be. But I've also watched how people want to get so wrapped up in theological issues that they lose focus on the mission. I've seen people debate, uh, you know, end times, eschatology. They got to, when's Jesus going to come back and how's it going to play out? And is it going to be before the, the, the tribulation or is it going to be after? Is the rapture going to happen here or there? And I've watched people get angry at each other because they don't agree over something that none of us know exactly how it's going to happen. And, they, and then it distracts from the mission because they're so wrapped up in trying to figure out what this means and what this says when in reality, Jesus is coming back and we win. Okay? <laughs> the rest of it is all just details. Right? Uh, what, what about the people arguing about and, and dividing over the gifts of the Spirit? You know, do tongues have a place in worship? How are we going to use the gifts? And what should we do? What's the proper way? And, and what do you do in private? What do you do in public? And how does that play out? And, and that's been an issue that, that churches have divided over. Or, or the subject of election. We talked about this a few months ago. That, you know, do we choose Jesus or does Jesus choose us? It's one or the other, Okay. And, uh, and that's reality, but I've watched people break fellowship over that issue or let that issue distract them from the mission of Christ. The, the issue of creation and evolution, the issue of which version of the Bible to use. You go, really people fight over that? Yes, they do. True story. Uh, back in the time I was finishing up seminary, uh, I had the privilege to, to be the interim pastor of the church I was serving at as the youth pastor. And, uh, and they were interim, which means the pastor left. And, and so uh, uh, a lot of the people in the church knew me. I'd been there on staff for over two years. And they wanted me to be the pastor. And the reason that they did not hire me to be the pastor is because the search committee decided that I didn't preach out of the right translation of the Bible. Okay? I issues that distract from the mission of Christ. And so uh, there are lots of theological debates that become distractions. 
Uh, and then, of course, there's methodological arguments. How are we going to carry out the mission of Christ? And, and I've seen, you know, churches fight, people fight over how we do mission. You know, uh, what kind of music are we going to play? How long is worship going to be? What's, are we going to have an invitation or not? Uh, you know, what's the order of service going to look like? What, what kind of ministries are we going to invest in? How are we going to use the money that we collect in the offerings? Um, those all become distractions. And, and if you've been around churches long enough, you've seen them argue over, you know, uh, the color of the carpeting. Did you guys notice we took care of that issue? <laughs> we decided we would never be a church that argues over carpeting. We just won't have any. See? Makes it really simple, doesn't it? Uh, you know, people argue over, you know, uh, the, the menu at potlucks or banquets. It's just crazy the stuff that people argue over, and, and yet it becomes a distraction. Uh, and then there's distractions like gossip and slander and rumors and personal attacks and power struggles. But the Apostle Paul says the mission of Jesus is the priority. Don't let anything get in the way of that. Don't let anything be an obstacle to leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. You see, that's our priority as Calvary. We're going to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through the love of his people, through the power of his truth. And, and so we have five essential doctrines. Five essential doctrines. In other words, these are the things that we feel like we need to agree on as the body of Christ. Five statements, you can look them up. You can pick up a, a pamphlet on your way out if you don't know what they are. They're on our website. They're on pretty much everything we print. And, and that's just us saying, hey, here's the essentials that we need to believe. Now, every other doctrine that isn't included in those five essentials is important. And we want to study and we want to learn. But what we're saying is we don't have to agree on that. If I preach something you don't agree with, I, it doesn't bother me at all. Okay? And I don't feel like you, I, I understand, I don't feel like you need to agree with me. What I feel like you need to do is study the Bible and figure out why you believe what you believe. Okay? And, and because what we're not interested in here at Calvary is uniformity of thought. We're not interested in uniformity of thought. What we want is unity in love and in mission. That's what we want. And so we've got five essentials. Everything else is important, but we don't have to agree on that as long as you're okay with me not agreeing with you. See, see how that plays out? As long as you're okay with other people disagreeing with you as well and it not becoming your issue. Uh, that's why we have strategies that are constantly adapting to the situation. In other words, um, we are married to the mission of Christ, but we just date strategies. Do you guys understand that, what that means? That means that programs, the things we do, the way we do stuff, uh, we're, we're always going to change those. Because the culture we're living in is changing and the strategies need to change with it. Uh, by the way, change is one of our core values here at Calvary. We believe that it's impossible to follow Jesus and stay where you are. And if that's true for you as an individual follower of Jesus Christ, it's true for us uh, as a congregation of followers of Jesus Christ. We're going to have to change. And what worked 10 years ago probably doesn't work tomorrow. And, and so we need to alter some things. And if you've been around here any length of time at all... We've been changing the whole time. And sometimes you like the changes and you cheer them on and sometimes you grieve the changes and you don't like them. But here's the thing. If they help us lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus, then the mission is what's important. The strategies are just what's uh, happening at the time. And, and then just honestly, we're not going to listen to gossip or rumors. I, I'm just one of those rumor busters. You show up in my office and say, uh, I heard this about so-and-so. Uh, I'm just going to pick up the phone and call them. Or walk next door to their office and talk to them. Hey, I heard a rumor. Is any truth to it? Freaks people out, so they stop coming to me with rumors. <laughs> We're just going to bust them. If they're true, we need to act on them. But we don't want to play this whole secrecy, private whisper thing. It's not honoring to God. So we're not going to let distractions derail the mission of Jesus because God has entrusted us with the message of hope. See, this is why we don't want any distractions because God has given to us the message that will change people's lives, that will take the hopeless and give them hope, that will take the lifeless and give them life. 
See, if you've been with us for this whole study, last six months, you've heard this from the beginning to the end. Romans chapter 1, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. Romans 6, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans chapter 8, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 10, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You see, we want every person to hear and respond to the message of hope. Every single person. That, that's our desire. We want people to know that God loves them and God rescued them and God forgives them and God promises them eternal life if they follow Jesus. So have you heard the message of hope? Have you responded to the message of hope? Have you confessed Jesus with your mouth as Lord? Believed in him? That God raised him from the dead? Have you surrendered your life to Jesus? If not, what are you waiting for? And if you're sitting here and you're thinking, I, I, I want to do that. I don't know how to do that. I need to talk with someone. Our prayer team is going to be here at the front after the service. They would love to talk with you about having that personal relationship with Jesus. Pastors will be at both of the Connection Centers and just find us and say, hey, I want to talk to you about what it means to follow Jesus because that's what we want. We want to share that message of hope with you. And by the way, just for the record, we don't want anything to become an obstacle to this message of hope. We want you, who are followers of Jesus Christ, to be comfortable inviting your friends. We want you to be comfortable saying, hey, come to church with me. Uh, and, and you know that they're going to hear the good news and you know they're not going to be distracted by other stuff. Because we're real intentional about trying to remove obstacles from that message of hope and from you being able to, to bring that message of hope to your friends, to your family. So we do things uh, to remove the distractions. For instance, the length of the service. We're intentional about the, the service being an hour long. And some of you go, oh man, can't we just do it longer? Can't you preach longer? Can't we do more music? We could. We're not going to. Okay. You know why? Because we want you to be able to invite your friends. And the first thing your friends are going to ask you when you invite them to church is, so how long do I have to go? You know it. If somebody invites you to something, that's the, you better ask that question. You know some of these dance recitals like last three days? You better find out how long you're committing for. And, and if you tell people an hour, if they're a friend of yours, I mean almost any friend will give you an hour. You know, they'll even help you move for an hour. I just don't want to do it all day. So, you know, it's going to be an hour. The, the, the music and volume of the service is intentional. And some of you wish we'd be intentional to turn it down. And for you, we're launching a new campus venue. Actually, we're not doing it for you. We're just doing it uh, because we're out of space. Uh, but uh, because God keeps sending us people. But honestly, the new McCulloch campus, the, the venue is going to be very much like this, but quieter. Uh, lights a little more calm and, uh, and, and so if you come and you always are thinking or often are thinking I wish they'd just turn it down a little bit we want you to go over to McCulloch and enjoy the service there because uh, it, that's what we're, we're targeting it for so uh, just know that starting in January that's going to be an option that you have or if you've invited friends and they think it's too loud then you can just invite them again and invite them to try out that new campus that new venue because we're going to need about two to 300 people to, to launch that, that campus off. And, and if that's what appeals to you, then, then uh, by all means, make it your place. Um, we don't welcome guests like we used to. If you were around at, at Calvary before we moved over here to Sweetwater, we used to have a stand and greet time in the service, have everybody greet each other, because extroverts like me love that stuff. And then I started reading articles and surveys saying that guests hate it. And, and yet we want our guests to be comfortable, so we just decided we'd, we'd stop doing that. 
We, we want to meet them. We want to welcome them. They want to meet us, but they want to be welcomed, but they don't want to be made to stand up and fake shake hands with people. So uh, we just, we stopped doing it. You know, our, our kids' ministry is a priority, is a huge thing. We do that because it's about the mission, and we want to reach young families, and young families got to know their kids are being taken care of. We do that on purpose. Our casual attire is on purpose. Uh, you know, and, and some of you would be like, hey, you know, we used to dress up for church. Dressing up would be cool. And by the way, you're, feel free to dress up if you want to. But the second question that your friends are going to ask you when you invite them to church is how long is it going to take and what do I have to wear? And we want you to be able to tell them whatever you, whatever you want. It's perfectly fine. Just like you're dressed right now is fine. And they're going to come and they're not going to feel awkward because you guys are just as casual as they are. See? It's really important. You know, it's why we serve the community. It's why we have offering boxes. Because we don't want to be a distraction to the gospel. We want the message of hope to be able to penetrate people's lives so they can hear it and they can receive it and they can act on it and, and they can become followers of Jesus Christ as well. So we begin with the priority of mission. We want to be intentional to remove distractions so we can amplify the message of hope. And then we conclude with the promise of victory. The promise of victory. Did you catch this? This is so cool. Verse 20. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. The God of all peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. So if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the, of the world, and you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus Christ, then you have been promised by God victory. We win. Some of you think that's a nice idea. See, I think that is the coolest idea ever. We win. There's nothing that can take that victory away from us. There is nothing that can steal it away from us. There's no way we can blow this. I say that because I'm an Arizona Cardinals fan. Uh, okay? There's no way we can lose out. We can't give it up. We can't cough it up. We can't fumble it away. The victory is signed, sealed, and delivered. It was finished on the cross. It became apparent to us on that Easter morning when Jesus left the tomb empty. We have been declared the victors, and God will soon crush Satan under our Feet. That is like really cool. And, and we're just kind of thinking, uh, yeah, but not soon enough. Right? We read that and we kind of go, yeah, but it needs to happen like sooner. Because the world is difficult. And our world is difficult. I mean, there are tragedies. Like crazy people shooting up synagogues and schools. By the way, when I use the word crazy in that place, what I really mean is demon-possessed. It's demonic. It's evil at the very core that people would do that without reason. We need, we need to understand that evil is alive and well. There's tragedies, there's pain, there's disease, there's betrayal, there's divorce and brokenness, there's persecution. Got to hear stories of real life persecution from our missionaries that are serving in areas where they're the only Christians living. We see our nation turning from God and we, and we watch all of the stuff happening and yet we are promised victory. Promised victory. And sometimes, if we're honest about it, it doesn't feel very triumphant. Uh, you know, sometimes you read the news, you watch what's going on, you see how, how the world is, you experience tragedies personally, and you don't feel very triumphant. You're kind of going, when's it going to happen, God? You promised to crush Satan under our feet, but when's it going to happen? So this is the question that it really kind of begs. How do we live in victory when we see so much defeat? How do we live in victory when we feel defeated? Or maybe sometimes you're just thinking, who's crushing who? Honestly, there's no easy answer. There is a lifelong process 
that makes the promised victory more of a present reality in our lives. Uh, We're talking about habits that we engage in that change the pattern and direction of our lives. And uh, there's not a magic word, there's not a simple fix, there's not an easy button. But if you apply consistently these habits to your life, your life will be different, even triumphant. So I want to share with you four phrases uh, so you can remember them. So that you can use them as a, as a test for your life to see if you're moving in the direction of victor, victorious living or triumphant living. So uh, these are markers or, or a checklist uh, that I think are the, the things that are necessary if we're going to live in that victory that we've been promised. First one is you got to love God. We know the great commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Okay, that's, that's the great commandment. That's what Jesus gave. He said, hey, here it is. This is the first and greatest commandment. And, and everybody nodded their head because they understand that. And we understand that, that we've got to love God. If we're going to have victory, then we've got to love God. So this is about your relationship with God. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you already have a relationship with God, but are you paying attention to that relationship? Are you nurturing that relationship? Because you can't live in the victory unless you're getting closer to God. Which is why worship is so important. Is it a priority in your life? It's why praising God is so important. Thanking God is so important. Because that practice of praising God and thanking God for the blessings and and recognizing them and and naming them gets you closer and closer to God. It's why prayer is so significant. You talking with God, bringing your needs before God, asking God to meet your needs, asking God to bless the people around you, even your enemies. Because that's about relationship with God. Celebrating redemption and forgiveness and eternal life is part of that relationship with God. Where you acknowledge the victory rather than complaining about the momentary setbacks. If we're going to live in the victory that God has promised, we have to love God. And we have to learn the Bible. We have to learn the Bible. The very first psalm, uh, I love it. It says, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the path of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers but in his law is his delight in god's law is his delight and on it he meditates day and night and because he does that he is like a tree that is firmly planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf doesn't wither in everything he does he prospers that's an amazing promise of God that that overlays how we live our lives and and this is all about wisdom you can't have victory in your life unless you know and live the truth of God now we're we're just wrapping up a 50-day Bible reading uh, challenge okay 50 days ago we challenged you and and here we are at the very end of it and and how many of you have have made it Okay, praise God. Now, some of you didn't make it, and, and some of you finished it, so here's the challenge. Do it again. Do it again. You go, I just read it. Really? Can you, do you remember what it said? If I just pull a chapter out, and can you tell me about that chapter? Besides 1 Corinthians 13. Can, can you tell me about you know, what it said in that chapter? Read them again, or if you don't want to read them again, then read the Gospel of Luke and follow that up with Acts. That'll get you through the end of the year pretty much. In other words, have a plan. Absorb Scripture in your life. You've got to learn what it says. You've got to put it into practice. It's just, it's a, it's a discipline that, that we need because we can't be free unless we know the truth. Satan's power over us is predominantly lies. Know the truth. If you want to be free, know the truth. So love God, learn the Bible, live the character of Christ. Live the character of Christ. Did you notice what he said at at verse 19? For your obedience is known to all, so that I rejoice over you. Your obedience is known. They're living out the character of Christ. 
James chapter 1, verse 22 says, Be doers of the word and not hearers only, and so deceive yourselves. It doesn't, honestly, it doesn't do any good to know the truth if you don't apply the truth to your lives. And so we need to live the character of Christ. Character is so important. It's one of our core values here at Calvary. We believe that you cannot represent Jesus unless you reflect his character. Without character, we just become hypocrites who become obstacles or distractions to the message of hope. So character, it's how you treat people, right? Because love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength is the first and great commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on those two. Okay, that's the summary. Jesus said, you want to please God? Love him and then love people like he loves them. So how do you treat people? How do you treat your family? How do you treat your coworkers? How do you treat your customers? The people who wait on you in the restaurants that you're going to go to after the service. You know, the, one of the things that I was most proud of was uh, at the end of our mission trip, uh, the missionary who had invited us to come and, and help them uh, sat down with us. We were just talking through it. And, and he said to uh, the leaders of our, our kids group, and, and I was there, and I, I just got to hear it. And his, he said, you guys were, were so professional and so spiritually mature in difficult situations, and he just wanted to commend them. You know what that is? That's character. That's character. They lived out the character of Christ in difficult situations. And if we want to live in victory, then we've got to live the character of Christ. So we love God, we learn the Bible, we live the character of Christ, and we lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Can't really experience victory unless we're involved in the mission of Jesus Christ. I mean, why would we expect God to lead us to live triumphantly if we're ignoring his priority? I mean, wrestle with that. If you're ignoring God's priority, then why is he going to bless you with triumphant living? See, so who are you leading toward Jesus? Are you leading your family toward Jesus? You know, are, are you leading your spouse toward Jesus? Are you leading your kids toward Jesus? I mean, I know you love your kids, uh, and, and I'm just going to say this. Uh, I love the fact that a lot of families are focused on building memories these days by doing cool things, fun things, trips, and stuff like that. I did a lot of that in my life as well when my, my girls were younger. Um, but here's the thing. You know what's more important than building memories? Building character. Character. Instructing them in the things of God and, and making, you know, your commitment to Christ a living reality in their lives. Are you leading your friends toward Jesus? Have you even invited them to come to church with you? Your co-workers, your neighbors, other parents at the school or the sporting events. And, and by the way, I'm just going to say this, our next great opportunity to do that is Wednesday night down on Main Street for Halloween. And some of you are thinking, oh, we don't need to help with that. Our kids are grown. Perfect. You got nothing else to do then, Wednesday night. <laughs> Come on down and hang out with us. Go on the website, sign up. Some of our life groups, you know, you've been thinking, hey, you know, we've served in the past. Let's take a year off. Why? Why would you take a year off? Why would you say, hey, you know what? We love people normally, but we're going to skip this year loving people on Halloween. We're just going to take it off. I'm, and, 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 and honestly, and I'm sharing this because we've got about half the people signed up to help with Main Street that we had last year. And, and as a pastor, that just irritates me. I don't know what else to say because I'm going like, why? Why did we suddenly decide that serving isn't a priority when it's a priority to Jesus? Because when you're down there, you're blessing people. And you might think, hey, this is not really important, but it really is because we've had a, a ton of families that have come into our church when we first met them on Main Street. Because they see us loving their children. They see us sugaring their children up ridiculously. They see us being generous with candy and caring about their kids with no agenda. And sometimes it leads to a God conversation, and that's really cool, but it almost always leads to being able to invite people to come be a part. 
So I'm just going to challenge you. If, if you think, uh, hey, I'm just taking a, a, a year off or our life group's going to pass this year, repent. And, and jump in and, and go to the website and sign up and say, hey, I want to serve. I want to help. I want to be a part of this. Because if we're going to really live in victory, then we've got to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. So four things. Love God, learn the Bible, live the character of Christ, lead people to Jesus. That's how to see the promised victory become more of a present reality in your life. Choice is yours. What are you going to do with it? Let's pray.